check check there we go okay weird so uh pretty sure that means that none of the stuff i was saying earlier was actually going through um which is great <laughs> okay so i unplugged my mic so it should be playing music and it should be listening to me now sorry for that whole seven minutes of me setting up and not saying anything Hey guys, it's Heath. Um, I'm working on Roland today. I'm applying shadows and I'm also doing, uh, I think, final rendering because I think I'll have time for that, um, which I'm pretty excited about. Um, to all my three viewers, what's up, guys? And um, yeah, just basically putting finishing touches on this guy and uh, going from there. Honestly, I don't think it'll take me three hours, um, but we'll see. These things kind of tend to surprise you. Um, also, anyone who's watching, uh, make sure to like and subscribe my uh, uh, Twitch stream, which is uh, Heathasaurus Art, H-E-A-T-H-A-S-A-U-R-U-S Art, um, Heathasaurus Art, and also to like and subscribe my YouTube channel, which I believe is based on my username, Foley Foley1234, super mature, I know, I made it in high school, forgive me. Um, beyond that, also make to share and like and tell people, and I also have an Instagram and a Facebook, Art of HF, for both Instagram and Facebook. Um, I'd appreciate any attention you guys would want to spend to it. Um, uh, spend to it. Give to it. Um, but yeah, I should have audio, I should have music, it looks like I've got a response to it, so I'm going to keep going. Just working on colors today. Or shadows. I also have discovered the immense joy of working in acrylic paint. Um, I actually started doing that over the weekend and it was pretty freaking magical to work in it. So there may be a stream in the future or a stream in the future of me painting with acrylics, so we'll see what's up. I don't think I ever finished doing shadows on all this leather stuff. I would have most definitely done that. Eh, you know. These things happen. Also realized earlier I was asking you guys to let me know if you could hear me or not, and I realized if you couldn't hear me, there's no way of actually responding to it. Big brain time. Yeah, working with acrylics has been really freaking fun. I mean, you know, I know digital stuff decently well. Um, I'm not going to claim to be a master or anything of it, but, um, you know, it's the home medium I've been working on for a number of years. Working acrylic is actually pretty sweet. I got a kind of Legend of Zelda, Ocarina of Time uh, feel for the overall piece, which I thought was pretty cool. And if you guys want to see that, I'm going to be putting that on Instagram. So make sure to follow me there so you can actually check it out. I've also recently discovered the fun of Instagram.
Yeah, I will save this for acrylic painting too, man. It is, it is not forgiving. Well, actually, I think out of painting, it is the most traditional forgiving because, you know, you really screw up and then you just kind of look back and go, well, I guess I'm going to just paint over this now because the stuff dries so fast. Also, because of fun copyright claims, I'm having to use YouTube's like copyright royalty free stuff. Which I don't mind, it's been pretty good so far, but every now and then it does something like this where it plays something completely out of genre on one of these playlists. And uh I'm not sure I'm a big fan. Swinging piano, jazzy routine. So good for drawing. Be careful with purples, they're a little finicky. Just switch this for myself. What is going on? That's a little bit better. It's not jazzy, see? No, Russell, not bringing back the swing music. You can mute me and go listen to swing music. That's an option.
customer. Are you paying for this? <laughs> I mean, if you are paying for this, and absolutely, I'll play all the swinger music you can imagine. I think what we both know, I think what we both know is that your time is worthless. Don't lie. Don't lie. Just not trying to hurt your feelings, it's just a harsh truth. of how I shadow things. Nope. I just get in there and I start. No. Yeah, there's a method. So, typically I like to kind of get my big zones first. Um, big zones being like big spots of color, like the red here or the red here. Um, typically I find myself doing like the less complicated stuff first. Less complicated stuff is generally for me, which is going to sound strange. It's cloth and fabric. Oh, hey, Lily. Go on. Go on. I love you. You're adorable. Go on. Home is safe. Get out of here. Um, but I choose the areas I know are going to be a little bit easier for me to do. You know, like I know where the light source is coming from, so I know on this kind of arm protection thing, where the light's going to cast over, where I need to be hard and soft on things, and um, makes it a little bit easier. So generally, I go from like easiest to most complicated, like. If you watch the other streams, you may have noticed that I was absolutely ignoring the head on this guy. Um, right out the gate, too. And um, it's because the head's the most complicated part. I mean, when you look at this design, you know, the first thing you're going to notice is his face, his eyes, his smile, what he's looking at, and all that kind of stuff. The rest of the stuff just kind of, you know, merges in. But, um... No, I think, I think with shadows, it's just kind of picking out the big chunks, trying to make it look as rounded as possible. The real trick is when I get into the rendering stage, which shouldn't be too far off, to tell you the truth. If I'm right, I may be wrong, we'll see. Yeah, beyond that, I just try and use a big soft brush for, like, doing rounded stuff, and more of my, like, hard edge markery brush for, uh, carving in more details and things like if you notice in the red over here it's kind of a soft gradient so i definitely use my big soft brush for that but then for like this stuff carving under where the fold is more of hard shapes i use the harder edge line a hard round 35 brush which you guys can't see because i figured 
You guys probably don't need to see every little thing. Let's see what we're going to do next. You know, I think it's pants time. Pants, pants, pants. Pants, pants, pants. So I'm going to do something slightly different with this. <laughs> Work aggro, I get it. Um, basically, uh, I'm going to get... Um, the shadows are almost like the easy stage. They're pretty important, but they're almost the easy stage for me. Once it gets to the rendering stage, I'm really going to be able to like put some serious energy into uh, how that rendering and stuff is going to go. Like Right now, it's just me working clothes, trying to get shadows in the right places overall. Like It's all kind of... I think soft is the right way of putting it. It's all relatively soft with how I actually handle things, but um, once you get to rendering, I can start really carving out some serious shapes. Like right now, I'm working on this pant leg here. So I'm just gonna soften up the line around the edges of it because I know it's rounded. And you know, even if things are rounded, um, they're still going to contain shadows and whatnot. And then I'm going to come in with my hard brush and I'm going to kind of just chisel out areas. Shadows are really soft. Typically they involve a lot of hard lines and a lot of soft lines at the same time. So it's actually kind of funny. I'm learning the more I do this, the line work is almost a um, almost a negative thing sometimes. Because sometimes I kind of get caught in detailing that stuff way more than I actually should. Old comic book habits. You know, if you're doing, if you're rendering things in black and white, you got to make sure that every single detail is there and. You're showing an accurate amount of stuff while trusting someone who may or may not come and color something after you to come and handle it. So doing everything myself, I kind of try and make sure everything's idiot proof, but um, it's not always successful. As with most things in life, trying to idiot proof things. So I'm actually doing something different with the pirate pants here. Um, so normally I was selecting out zones and coloring them individually, but with the pirate pants I'm coloring them as like two. I'm combining both the colors in their own specific layer. Because it's just easier to color them this way and there's no reason why I shouldn't. Anyways, yeah, I think that's most of the color that I need. Oh wait, yeah. <laughs> the tail and the other stuff. That's right. I also do not like how light oh god there we go I'll darken these up not crazy just enough okay uh, let's render some metal let's boogie
Luckily, this is actually really dead simple here. Because it's all kind of simple geometry. All I gotta do is pick the part that's facing away from my light source. And because the details are kind of small, I can kind of get away with doing really solid color breakdowns on things. Solid patches of color, if you will. This is big enough, I'm going to render a little bit of a gradient there. Alright. Like I said, none of this stuff's permanent. But short term, I need some kind of base to work off of for the rendering stage. You guys will see when I get there. Like, the shadows are almost. You know, I don't want to call them an afterthought. That just seems wrong. Oh, thank you, sir. Funky now. Ooh, and this is a blood groove. Oh, that was really strong. Sorry. The evil weapon is so violent. Okay. flat shape, so I need to render it. It's a hard brush. Do all this. What I really like is when I render two sections separately at some point or another, and eventually get back to doing things that are side by side, and realizing like, oh yeah, I did have a plan for this. And it all comes together. I'm just rendering a little bit of that is so weird how it keeps happening. Oh, that's what happened. My elbow hit a button. That would explain a lot. Oh yeah, I'm gonna have to make that gray darker. That's fine. Yeah. I think the only things remaining really at this stage are, in my mind, his tail and his face and his shoulder over here, but I'm considering a part of his face. So. Yeah. Alright, so I'm going to do the same trick I did before. Or just use a multiply layer. Ooh. Too aggressive.
Oh yeah, things cast shadows on stuff. There we go. Alright, that looked like really rudimentary shadowing on the uh, tail there, but I promise you I will get back to it because I'm planning on kind of going heavy rendering-wise on that zone, and we'll see how it turns out. Okay. Let's work on the face. You know what? I'm gonna try it on the face too. That's on continuous. Yeah, that's on. So I always like to think this is kind of a muzzle on Roland and all these wonder characters I've done. realize something. I could actually render this all, then come back and actually change the color to what I want it to be. Oh, oh, oh. Been doing this for years. Never thought about this method. Cool. It's adorable. It's not swinger music, Russell, I know. Thank you. 
Handheld catapult. Uh, I think there was actually a Chinese weapon kind of like that. It didn't launch. I mean, it was a crossbow, but they like laid on their back and like load, like literally laid on their back and then used all of their physical strength to load this thing and then to launch it farther than like almost any arrow. It was crazy. A handheld catapult. I'm even trying to, like, imagine what that would look like. Isn't that just a crossbow? Or, I don't know, a gun? Trebuchet. A handheld trebuchet. <laughs> I'm pretty sure the sheer physics of how they work would kind of make holding one a little scary. Oh, that looks so nice. Okay, we're gonna just calm that down a little bit. Yeah. Okay, so what I'd like to do is go to here. Let's see if we can't make some adjustments. Looks good. Nice. Oh man, that totally works. Alright, cool. That may be a new working method there. I forgot that's even a freaking option. Alright, so I believe after I get this arm done, I should be ready to start into the rendering phase. Ooh, all oh, rendering. 
So I just call it that. It's more like highlights, but then I realized very quickly that uh, I wasn't just doing highlights. I was like fixing shadows and doing textures and all this other stuff. Calling it highlights just kind of sounds, I don't know. Not qualified. It doesn't qualify for what I'm actually doing. Nope, nope, wrong layer. Yeah. By the way, are you guys interested in seeing the layers and brushes and stuff I'm using at all? If so, I'm, I can, I'm more than capable of making that happen. By the way, just, I'm petting my dog. Sorry if there's a loud smacking noise. She enjoys it. I'm not just committing animal abuse in my home. All right, go on. Go on, get out of here. You're adorable, and you smell like the outside. Alrighty. Ah, oh, burb. I keep forgetting about burb. layer because I'm smart. Yeah, whatever. I'll be fine. Honestly, I'm not really worried about this point. If this was a more professional piece, like something I'd be giving to a client or something, I'd probably be a little bit more careful about everything, but only because people make changes and opinions and that is okay they are paying for a thing you hear that Russell paying for things gets you opinions enough to get started on the next stage. Actually, hold on. A couple of little things. Let me get to... I feel like there's just a general... Never be afraid to make big adjustments if you need to. Unless you're being asked to draw a trebuchet, being held in the hand of a character. You should ignore that suggestion. Unless you are, in fact, a big fan of trebuchets, i.e. the best siege equipment ever. Uh, your tanks are pretty up far up there too. This coat needs darker bits. All right. Well, shadows have been applied. He is nice and rounded now, which is nice. Uh, let's... Hmm. You know what? I've kind of been dodging it. Work on my face. Oh god, close up. I see his nose, and I'll get to it. First of all, let's get an iris in here. We're going to start a new layer. We're going to call it rendering. Oh 
also going to darken this up because it's an iris. I've always liked working on eyes. I'm actually going to make another layer to get underneath here. Just kind of fun to render and give a character a little bit more life. Also, they are concave to a degree. Oh no, watch out for the anime influences. I really do, I can't help it. There's just certain things I've always liked about anime. They've always done eyes really interesting and there's like dozens of styles of how they do eyes. But that being said, I try not to have too heavy influences one way or another. I mean, anime is obviously one of them. I grew up with the stuff. Those kids that grew up watching Dragon Ball Z and Toonami. You know, the show where they yell for five straight minutes. <laughs> I remember one time on the show they were um, battling Frieza. And it was Goku versus Frieza. And it was in like final couple of uh, minutes of the show or the final well the let me rephrase it the battle was like supposed to take 30 minutes before the planet mammoth explodes right um, well guess what that was six episodes what look at these sweet eyes nice all right uh, let's go and do these bad boys Layer. So, eyes aren't white. I've seen different variations of how people render them. Um, I've seen people try and do white, that's kind of solid white, it's more cartoony. I've seen people do um, yellow, like I was playing uh, Horizon Zero Dawn and I saw all their eyes were kind of yellowy in it and it worked in the tone, overall world that they were building. But uh, in the Wander, I try and make everyone's eyes blue, at least the whites, the whites of their eyes, quote unquote, blue. Yeah. It's about the eyes of the character, it always makes changes, or it always, let me rephrase that, not makes changes, it always brings a whole bunch of life to the thing that I really enjoy. So we are going to start rendering this. Right. So all I'm doing here is you'll notice the blinking lines and I make them disappear. I'm not just deselecting things, I'm actually um, I'm actually hiding them a little bit. A little bit, completely, completely hiding them. Right now, all I'm doing is trying to kind of render out the shape of his muzzle. I'm using a lot of white to do so, which is okay. And he's got a bit of a lower lip. Goes down to the chin. Uh, 
And I know it looks very smooth right now. I will fix that, I promise. Ooh, got funky again. this nonsense. All right, so here's what I'm going to do. Since they are furry characters, not <laughs> furry characters, since they are, have hair, are capable, I'm going to just use a little bit of this Conti brush that I used to do all the initial line work. And add a little bit more rendering. because I think it looks good. concern I've been having a whole lot recently with digital painting is just, you know, it looks digital. I mean, there's ways it 
can also not look digital, but to me more than anything else, I've realized a lot of my work looks very digital. And that's that's okay. Digital art, but there's also a lot of really talented guys out there that are capable of making their stuff look like traditional paintings and always made me a little jealous. But, you know, there's a way around that and there's a way to fix that. And you do that by learning how to digitally freaking paint so you're no longer jealous of other people being able to do it. Yeah. Yeah, it looks pretty good to me. Now I'm gonna add a little one. Also because I know how this stuff is gonna go, I'm going to do booper rendering. some attention. Go back to the normal brush I was using a second ago. Switch our flow back because it works better. All I'm trying to do is kind of set out these preconceived shapes that I've given them. But you know, if you can look from the line art, like if you just look at line art and shadows, I haven't done a ton to really notify what the shapes are and are not. But when I get in the rendering stage, I can absolutely start chunking that out, which Probably one of my favorite parts of it. All right. Let's see what happened. Yes, continue watching. I dare you. I dare you stop my tunes. Very definitive eyebrows. I might need to adjust a little bit. Go on the shadows layer. Ah, wrong way. I just want to soften this up a little bit. Come 
up here to rendering. Soften that up too. So it's a little less Cro Magnum. Nice. Okay, so I'm also going to go in here and I'm going to do a little. So to be 100% fair, this is absolutely me cheating. What I mean by that is that fur is hard to draw. And a lot of the times, I kind of don't want to. There's nothing in the rule book saying I can't pull this maneuver. It doesn't really matter, just try and keep consistent. Looks pretty good so far. Looks like a wander character. Conti brush, there we go. Max that up. Get an idea for this. Challenge the biggest, biggest part. Man, only an hour in, we're already at the rendering stage. We're making a very good time. Uh, let me maybe 
smart to do. Is to go ahead and get all the bits and render them all at the same time. trick on the tail. Let's try. Let's just see what happens. Good try something here. All right, well, I'm gonna take a little micro break here and I will be right back.
Back and edit. Photoshop, why'd you have to update and then change all of my settings?
Hmm. Question is, we're going to want to go next. You know what? Blood of love. Let's do it. For all of them. It's nothing, it's just standing out. <clears throat> Sorry for that fun noise there. There we go. That looks like a glove, kind of. <laughs> Pretty good about that. See, it's at a point where I can just kind of go and have fun with the rendering stuff, which is one of the great joys working on this kind of stuff. Because if eventually getting to that plateau, where you're like, okay, I'm just going to start down.
that doesn't look right. You know what? I feel like we need a little saturated highlight and this leather glove rendering here. Just something to make it pop. You know what? I'm gonna keep up this leather train. This one's probably gonna take a hot minute.
Hey, just a friendly reminder to anyone watching, I'd really appreciate if you guys subscribed, or liked, or shared, or talked about this video, or stayed inside and washed your hands right now. Anything along those lines. I'm on Instagram as uh, Art of HF. I'm also on Facebook under a page of the same name. Um, you know, not really trying to grow or become some immensely popular streaming guy, but you know, some recognition is always nice. Uh, so if you guys could check it out and. Uh, you know, reaching a bigger audience would be pretty cool.
trying to find some music I can groove One, to. Two, three, four. Yeah, sure.
Oh, interesting. Welcome to the stream. Do I have any lore of Wonder documented? Not really. Um. Oh, so Drassus was a, um, so there was a webcomic long, long time ago, it feels like. And, um, basically Drassus was almost where the story started. It's a port city that was basically renowned for its free trade, its mix of cultures and characters. And so it was always kind of this, I wouldn't say infamous, but it was absolutely a port city. And um, so in my idea, the Wonders Guild is located near there because, you know, it's a port that can get around and do stuff pretty quickly. Um, But there's no official lore of the world yet. I know some people have been very interested in writing for us and wanting to kind of try out their chops, but um, we kind of kept it decently well under control for now because I think we're still kind of figuring out everything we want it to be. But uh, we have a pretty good idea of the lore and how all of it works overall, but I think that's part of it too, is there's so many little stories and things that can be told within all of this that, um, I don't know, we'll see. We'll probably open it up to try and tell more stories. I know we want to, but um, it's just finding the right person, the right writer, the right story to tell. Also, it's about time. Um, two dudes running a board game company kind of uh, limits your time egregiously. I mean, the only reason I can actually get to doing um, rendering like this is because of the pandemic, which is an awful thing overall, but you know, got enough free time now, so it makes it kind of nice. Ooh, so let's make another wander-themed game. What would we make it? Well, I think RPG was kind of the easiest go-to for that. Um, the game really kind of lends itself to fantasy and storytelling, so it's something we have and are actively discussing. The only problem with RPGs is they require so much writing, so much art, and uh, as with most things with us, sadly, 
Um, we're kind of limited on time. I don't want to be limited on time, trust me, but it's just the case. I'd say RPG. Um, if it's in the board game world, for sure. Because um, I feel like a card game, all we would do is have some kind of battle system in another game of choose a wanderer, you have a deck based for your attacks, and you start doing drafting and can start attacking monsters that way. Um, or you do something more the line, along the lines of, I don't know, I think an RPG is the way to go. Video games are a whole different question, though. I'd love to turn this into a video game. All I want is Breath of the Wild with Wander characters, and you can create your own Wanderer, load into the world, load into your friend's world with your character. He's the main character. You get to go around and do stuff. Go around all these locations and places, just like with that free play element of how uh, Legend of Zelda or uh, how Breath of the Wild worked, and then mix that with a really nice quest system and a good story. Oh, that'd be my dream game. I'd play that in a second. <laughs> Wander Streets of Rage. I thought about that too. A little side scroller where they like go through little things. Hell, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Manhattan Project was my jam, so I've got that in mind. Honestly, probably be fun. There's actually a game coming out. Uh, I saw a trailer for it a long time ago, and it looked like you basically made a mutant, and you fought all these like other mutated animal creatures. And the idea was based off your stats, your character's like shape and ability changed, and their fur color and pattern changed. It was a really cool concept. They look like a little red panda, so I was like, me, I like them. Infamously. I saw one in person, and they were adorable. What a damn cute boys. Dude, I did too. It was awesome. I I fully agree. Now I um my family, who we're at a stage where if we're all adults, if any of us want something, we just go buy it. Um, my family has been started doing gifts as experiences. So one of the things they got me was a red panda experience. So I got to go and feed and, not cuddle, but to feed and gently pet a live red panda. And the thing loves grapes, which if anyone out there knows anything about me, I love grapes. Shocking. And uh, yeah, it was pretty incredible. I get it, man. Those claws are for real. But they are very gentle. 
which I appreciate. Yeah, that's really cool. This is actually kind of cool. I uh, didn't tell the ladies kind of hosting the event until afterwards. It's like, I love them so much I made a board game and they're in there. Um, those, uh, the zoo ladies, they dug that board game. They immediately told me they had like a D and D session when them and all, all these other zookeepers like played uh, Animal Heroes, and I was like, "That's the most adorable thing I've ever heard." playtesting of Logan's Hero go? Uh, I wasn't actually there for that one. That was Jonathan and um, Logan. Actually, no, it was Jonathan and... No, it was Jonathan and Logan, because Logan was in town for my wedding. Um, apparently, he was busted. Apparently, like, because one of the rules is for every HP down he is, he gets another dice to roll with his attack. And if you get him with a bunch of health bonus items and then put him in a tanking position it's just freaking brutal actually this is going pretty well i'm pretty close Yeah, that's always the fun of playtesting new characters for Wonder is realizing how, uh, you know, we, we, we do careful balancing of everything, just playing the living crap out of stuff, and um, you realize pretty quick who's broken and who's not, and it also depends on equipment and stuff too, but I think uh, Logan is one of the characters that kind of proved to be a little busted. Also rolling with the nunchucks. Holy crap. Which character changed the most from original draft? Uh, uh. Oh, and for anyone watching the stream, um, we're talking about Wander the Cult of Barnacle Bay. Uh, my business partner, Jonathan, and I uh, developed a game, went to Kickstarter. It was super successful by our standards, and um, Tristan's a big fan of it, so we're just discussing characters and stuff that happen in it. It's a 1 to 5 player dungeon delving uh, uh, dungeon crawl game and it is a lot of fun and you should pick it up on the Panacult Games store, panacultgames.com and then there's a store link there. It's awesome. Um, which character changed from their original? I don't know. I Bexus and Kira went through some pretty big stat overhauls. John the Bard was probably the single most complicated character we've ever designed, but I'd have to say probably Roland, honestly. 
Roland probably went through the most dramatic change of anyone else. Because I think he went from being too powerful to underpowered to um, just right, somewhere in the middle. But yeah, I think Roland's. I think Roland's the answer there. Yeah. Well, I mean, man, if you went and checked, if you went to a panda, red panda experience, it makes sense that Rowan would uh, bring you in there. <laughs> I'm glad we got you too, man. It's been great having you around. God, I've drawn Rowan. I've probably drawn Rowan more than, well, that's a lie. I've drawn one character probably more than Rowan. That was Blaine from Mantic Games. I think I've drawn him like six or seven different times. Roland, I'm at least fifth time. I love that art, man. Um, I love the original sketches and concepts from the Red Panda Minis days. I mean, all those designs were so much fun to work on. Um, and they, they, it was a passion project, you know? It was um, something I doodled and put together and went, all right, this is cool. Um, these are just some designs I like doing. I'm a professional miniature designer. Then someone piped up and said, hey, what if you turn these into models? And I think that person was Jonathan. He likes to claim that he was inspired to see how that goes to then form the board game company, but I think it's hearsay. Uh, <laughs> Um, love you, Jonathan, if you listen to this. But, um, no, I love those old designs. I think they were the, they were the, the birth of this new generation of designs I started working on. And, uh, it's, it's been interesting seeing the turns Wander has taken from there. Um, it's definitely not on a path I would have predicted. The des designs kind of ended up getting more serious over time. Um, I think by the time we got to Barnacle Bay, I was working on a couple of different things, and uh, just realized this is super aggressive. There we go. What do you mean by my life changed when I committed to doing that? Committed to making a board game out of the characters, or just drew them? Or decide to do the Kickstarter for the models of them. If you're looking for... Ah, the minis in the games. I don't know, the minis were a fun experiment. Um, the whole idea was, can I make more money doing this than I can doing... Um, something oh no <laughs> I messed up it's fine I can fix it the process is almost perfect um the board game definitely was life-changing the minis were not um the minis were great in the sense of um, 
I did experiment to see if I could make more money creating a business and making my own minis than producing the artwork for it. And the fun result of that experiment was yes and no. Is... Oh, okay. Cool. Welcome. Um, I don't know. I, I think when the... When I did, when it did the miniatures, I kind of proved that I could make money off of the art, or off of producing the minis more. Because I watch watch people on Kickstarter take a design of mine and then make fifteen thousand dollars in two hours. And I was like, this, and they're paying me how much? Okay, cool. So after that, I decided to give it a shot, alternatively, and uh, see if I could do it myself, and I did. I made about seven and a half grand, if I remember right, maybe a little bit more, and that was great. Uh, the only problem was is that doing the art, getting the mini sculpted, and the amount of time I put into it, if I had just been doing art, period, I probably would have made more. Uh, <laughs> but as a individual per design ratio thing, yeah, I made more money. Um, and then, you know, Jonathan and I used those minis and got all fired up and said, you know, hey, what if we um, turn this into a board game, start screwing around? And I mean, that sucker made 173 grand and blew our minds. You know, if I had a. Actually, John and Liz have a basement full of Wander stuff. Well, not the original miniatures. We, we phased those out at this point. We have the masters and we have those done, so that's that's not a big concern. But um, uh, yeah, John and Liz actually have a garage in a basement room full of Wander stuff, like old minis and um, replacement parts and boxes and pieces and bits and things like that. So they exist; they're floating around. I'm sure with every game that we work on, that collection is going to get bigger. As far as Wander artwork goes, though, I'm the king of that. I've got the most of that in my home. I'm actually working on a series of acrylic paintings based on the um, kids from Wander. Like, in the sense of, like, if Tank was a little kid, but he was in contemporary modern times and was imagining himself as a fantasy hero, I'm doing a series of uh, paintings like that, which you can see on Instagram, at Art of HF. Woo! Let me see, um, where do I need to go with this? Yeah, tank. Oh, thanks, man. I haven't even uploaded the final piece yet, but I plan on doing that soon. Um, actually, speaking of final pieces, I need to get this guy done. Oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> I accidentally rendered on this layer. That's fine. Oh, what age tank lost his arm? Um, so in the unofficial lore, uh, before Tank even joined the Wanderers Guild, he was a soldier in the Imperial Army. Um, hold on, a little... You know, I didn't exactly plan on doing a pattern on this bird, and here we are. He... Oh, that looks a little janky. It's okay, though. Eh. Oh lord, alright, no, do not, <laughs> oh my god, um, so Tank was an officer in the uh, Imperial Army, and uh, in Wander the Imperial Army is not necessarily good or bad, they're not great, and this isn't Ross, this isn't Ross's army, necessarily, this is, um, oh yeah, I knew it was you, Tristan, I figured the switch over from, um, Facebook was you. Um, just gonna pull this maneuver. 
Oh, my computer's making some loud noises. Okay. Um, the tank went over to the Imperial Army, and he was fighting in a battle. And basically, the general at the time, who, fun fact, is going to be, was the bad guy from the webcomic I did years ago, which one day I'll reveal that art. I'm not very proud of it, but it's not bad. Um, so the general basically put an order down to take down all civilians, and, um, you know, Tank was following his duties to a certain degree until he, you know, kind of crashed in on family with some kids. And, you know, he's basically ordered to take him out, and, uh, you know, that's a pretty harrowing thing to be asked to do from a soldier standpoint, so uh, Tank refuses. And I think for the first time in his young life, he uh, refuses the order of an officer in charge, and uh, in the process, a bunch of other soldiers come up and basically call him a traitor, and, you know, he's not following orders, and they're getting ready to do the job for him, but he steps in their way, and uh, as punishment for his crimes from, you know, not following orders, uh, they take his arm. Um, bite the hand that feeds you, that kind of a thing. So uh, he's so disillusioned with the entire process of the military and what they did and how they were basically, you know, taking families out instead of fighting the good fight like he thought they were, that um, he left of his own accord. He was basically branded a traitor. And eventually... Yeah, this is part of the reason why we haven't printed all this stuff, is like, it's a little serious. Um, so he was branded a traitor, but over time, luckily, while he was wandering around, hint, hint, um, he found his way to the Wanderers Guild and realized that they were doing things, you know, they're still getting paid to do jobs, but they are heroes and they were doing things in more of a proper way, and uh, he joined and liked joining an operation where he his opinion could be heard and you know he didn't get ignored or anything like that and um eventually he met mary fix it she made him a new arm so that that image of him from the original wander art was um way 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 well i wouldn't say way too early in his wander career i mean at that point tank is basically rowan's mentor and um Oh, how big do I feel the guild is? Ooh, that's a loaded question. So the guild, it's less of a, a singular hall. It's more of an overall organization, global scale. Um, that doesn't look bad. Yay, I can draw. Um, so it's like a global scale operation that has got basically a headquarters in, on most major continents. I think they're kind of like the Jedi in scale. Um, you know, they are big enough that they can send out people and they can have a result on a global scale, but um, at the same time, they're not, you know, toppling democracies and they're not that big, but. Um, I'd say globally, they've got a few thousand members floating around. Um, and that's, you know, like any organization, you know, everyone's not going to be the CEO or the big up top. You're going to have a lot of grunts doing a lot of grunt work, but basically they're a peacekeeping organization. But out of their ranks, there's always a few people who are going to stick out and do better. And, um, you know what? I kind of feel like doing something a little unique here. But uh, I'd say the core, the core branch, one of the first ones that formed, probably got, you know, maybe 200 to 300 members. Tank being one of them and being one of the oldest living members. There's a couple ones, though, that are, um, I'd say, you know, Tank is a turtle, so. Um, there's a couple ones that are older than him. 
uh, you know, and, and Tank's been offered every bureaucratic role you can possibly freaking imagine, but, um, you know, he, he prefers to be out in the field getting new wanderers ready for the adventure, that kind of thing. He's been a father figure to a lot of figures in uh, the Wanderers Guild. But overall, the idea is that um, he's been there for a while. Alluria. Um, I think that was our overall world name. Um, when I was working on the... Um, oh yeah, Lorekeeper Valen. God, I love her. She's going to be cool. So Lorekeeper Valen is almost like the... I don't know. She's she's always been a really a curious case for me. Oh yeah, hold on. Oop, nope, that's wrong. <laughs> Pretend like you didn't see that. Um, yeah, let's continue watching. Anyways, uh, Lord Keeper Valen was almost like a, uh, I think a, a deity is the wrong term. She's almost like a mythical demigod who records history. And she's found that the Wanderers Guild is, like, basically making history constantly. So she offers her services uh, to them. And, you know, she's, she's not owned by the Wanderers Guild. She doesn't, is, does not run them, anything like that. She simply is kind of their um, conscript, like, record keeper channels the lore and the history of the Wanderers Guild because she knows eventually it's going to make like genre defining moves which is pretty cool but I always liked her I always liked this like immortal creature that is of the old world but the Wanderers Guild has been around long enough that she was basically I wouldn't say a founding member but she was definitely there before it existed But no, I've got ideas for how the structure of the Wanderers Guild is set up and all that stuff. It's fun. Let me do a couple little things here. But yeah, we do eventually plan on expanding out the world and what that looks like. Just need to get to it. The interesting thing... <laughs> exactly. Toss a coin to your Lord Keeper. Perfect. Let me tell Jonathan about that one. He'll get a good giggle. Um... I don't know. I think Aloria is just, it's kind of a set piece. Like, there's an overarching thing going on right now in the world. Um, you know, there's a war brewing. There's evil afoot. And it's one of those things that's like, things are starting to happen, and it should be a pretty big concern to most people involved in the world. But, you know, it's it's like the back of the map to the campaign book. You know, there's Tobemeyer State, and there's Chopscotch Bay, and all these other places. Um, we're, we're kind of building out the world as we go. You know, there's other continents and other lands and other places. There's the north and south. And things that we just haven't gotten to yet, but we will. I hope we will. It'd be kind of sad if we didn't. It's a big world. There's a lot of lore that can go into a lot of different places. And I hope we get a chance to visit them all. explore the lore more um 
maybe. I had an idea. Um, so right now, you know, obviously the next expansion for Wonder we're going to do is going to be uh, the Clux Revenge, or the 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 Revenge of Captain LeCluck. So the idea is that Ghost Pirate Chicken Captain sails into Barnacle Bay. Um, you'll notice all the enemies in Wander are holding mysterious, co or all the enemies in Wander are holding coins of some sort. That's actually coins from LeCluck's treasure chest that are give them a boost of power and are corrupting them even more so than Elder Bane's magic is. And uh, so LeCluck's going to want her gold back, so she's going to come for it. But um, yeah, uh, I think the the war overall. I think it's already over by the time we see our heroes in Barnacle Bay. But, um, you know, there's things even the Wanderer's Guild can't see and can't predict. And um, I think the war is going to eventually have repercussions. We had an idea, I had an idea, to eventually do something where uh, the Wanderer's Guild assaults the capital because basically a general who is corrupt, the one that, you know, took the tank's hand, is trying to basically take over the kingdom for himself so it'd be like us in a cityscape fighting knights and other things i thought that could be an interesting setting what made elder bane go bad well elder bane was greedy and uh he had a thirst for power and he also didn't like how he was kind of both a land creature and a sea creature at the same time, because he's an amphibian. So he didn't know where he belonged, and he wanted power, and he wanted a following, so he made a deal with the evil Pandulu. And Pandulu promised that if he served under him, if Elderbane served him, that he would give him the power and acceptance he always wanted. And that power and that acceptance went to his head. And he got more powerful and more corrupt and more mutated, and eventually it warped his whole being. So that is what happened to Elderbane. That's what made him go bad. Before then, he wasn't a bad guy. He was kind of a missionary. Um, but... All people are capable of getting corrupted at some point or another. <laughs> I hope that was hope that wasn't too heavy. <laughs> Wander is a very light world, but some of the backstories to things can get a little heavy sometimes. All right, I need to do some tricks here. <laughs> Otter Grunt has to be the Otter Grunt. The Otter Grunt was just so fun. It was the first concept I really made for um, the game. It was like the first enemy I drew before Elder Bane, before anyone else. And he kind of set the standard for the whole visual thing. Oh, the Otter Grunt was by far one of my favorites. Um, let me, because I'm pretty sure I can finish this guy today. I was going to say, Tristan, what's your favorite design? You're asking me a lot of questions. <laughs> 
All right, I'll answer this one. If you go back five years and give yourself an art tip, um, try traditionally painting because it'll make you think about art in different ways than just digital. I love digital painting. It's it's basically, I mean, it's giving me a freaking career, honestly. But um, the only thing I found is that over time, You know, there's certain. Sorry, this is kind of delicate work I gotta do. Myself off by like 70. Um, oh lord, what am I doing? Oh yeah. That's right, I screwed that up. Whoops. Um, I don't know, yeah, I, I've just, I've started digitally painting recently, or not digitally painting, physically painting things recently, and it's been an eye-opener, like game-changing eye-opener of what I was doing differently, or what I, how I would handle things differently, than if I was doing it physically, like, there's a kind of spirit and a soul to doing things traditionally um, that I really like. Actually, you know what? Okay. Yeah, the Lady Otters. I was a big fan of the Lady Otters, too. I think they were fun. Something about the frying pan and the cartoony nature of one of them just smashing you in the head. It made me very happy. I'm glad Bebo was your favorite art. I, I was very proud of her. It was just fun. It was the idea of this like cat warlock with her little minion running around and A lot of parents like Bebo too. Ha, <laughs> the frying pan. Man, we should have made her a playable hero. Just giving her the legendary frying pan just for funsies. Just to see what people would do with her. done. I got 30 minutes left though. I can do it. Uh, I need to do some rim lighting and hmm, I could go blue or I could go peach. I think peach would be pretty cool. Also, I think we need to knock this down a little bit more. Yeah, that's more like it. Paint job is in Elizabeth Beckley's amazing miniature painting, or are you talking about me getting a chance to color something? Anyone painting. Ugh. One of my favorites was Aaron Lovejoy when he painted Tank. I like that one a lot. Just because he put it on a base and gave it pirate pants and had a whole bunch of different concepts I didn't think of. That was really cool. Um, Liz has done, obviously, you know, Elizabeth Beckley does amazing work. So it's been really fun watching her stuff. Um... 
I don't know. That's a really tricky question, just because there's so many painted models out there now. Yeah. I've seen people do Red Mohawk. I've seen people do some interesting things with Finn. I think that was Ian. Did really interesting stuff with Finn. Um... Sorry, this is going to start going a mile a minute here, so sorry if I get a little spacey there, Tristan. Um, I don't know, that's really tough. I, I, I honestly am having a hard time thinking of, because there are so many different painted pieces out there. I'm honestly just having a hard time calling them all. By the way, if ever, anyone ever does this, I'm going to love him to death. Uh, painting Roland as an actual panda. Not a red panda. Freaking panda. I think that'd be really funny. Sorry, I'm adding like Final Fantasy lighting to this thing. You know, it's funny. When I was in art school, I had a teacher who added rim lighting to a bunch of stuff. Exactly what I'm doing right now. And, um,. I don't know why, but a lot of the students said, oh, so-and-so, she's all about that rim lighting. Yeah. Why wouldn't you be? Rim lighting's awesome. Do you like things having a second light source and looking cool all the time? I'm biased. I use it all the time. Just so easy to do. Also, working with Ninja Division really helped me understand, which is strange to think, um, working with Ninja Division helped me understand a key aspect of what I'm going to get into with this, with the rim lighting. Which I also love how Facebook disconnected. I've got to figure that out. It's okay, nobody cares anyways. Um, but yeah, in my time of working at Ninja Division, um, doing some freelance stuff for them, I figured out uh, some fun stuff about something called Overlay in Photoshop, which is basically was like the bread and butter with a lot of their rendering. Their their rendering, their art stuff is great. Is always great. I mean, you know. But, um, yeah, while I was there, I learned about this overlay layer, which basically makes things look like they have super soft glow, which I'm a fan of. And then, when I was working on a game that got canceled, which is, I swear, a lot of my career, um, I got a chance to use it and I discovered peach, peach overlays. Oh, passion art for other IPs. You know what? Uh, the only fan art I think historic... Because fan art is... It's one of those things that there's people that do it better than me. It's got to be something like you're really into. Um, and I, I, I'm so interested in so many different things. That... Um, that glove looked decent? Yeah, that glove looks decent. Um, I'm interested in so many different things that it's hard to kind of block down what one specific fandom thing for me would be. But I will say this. Um, for my wife's birthday, 
Um, I mean, like, right before we got married, like, six or seven days before, actually. Um, I ended up, we, I was playing uh, Pokemon Sun and Shield and uh, loving the ever-living crap out of it. My first proper Pokemon game in, like, a decade. Bold. Um, and one of the coolest aspects was that um, she would sit there and watch me play and really enjoy the different Pokemon I was catching and stuff. Yeah. That Pokemon art. I did that in seven hours. <laughs> it's like, I... T Sadly, I did not have a present ready for her to go. I was a bad fiance at the time and uh, felt much guilt but um, I was literally like screw it I'm losing sleep and I'm gonna hunker down and get this thing done and I literally started working at I think six in the afternoon and did not stop until god that was when and uh, eventually I created that Pokemon piece for my wife and I and there's inside jokes in that piece too oh thank you there's inside jokes and things with that thing too, but um, overall, she she freaking dug it, man. So that's the thing is, I've I've been playing Final Fantasy VII Remake, and I've been tempted to do something off of that. Like if I drew Cloud, how would I draw him? Or what does tabletop gaming Cloud look like? Which is not far off from what he already looks like. Um. But uh, I don't really get into fandom projects much. You know, I dork out about things like Avatar The Last Airbender and, you know, Final Fantasy was really fun. I had a ton of fun playing Doom recently. Um, do I display much of my art at home? Well, I'm going to start doing that more. Here's the problem with digital art. <laughs> is that... Um, I straight up almost can't display a lot of my stuff at home because it's digital. I'd have to go and get it printed and I'd have to go get it um, framed and all this stuff. It just, it kind of turns into a burden. It's a bummer, but it's the truth. It's uh, having a digital art portfolio does not exactly lend you to having a bunch of stuff up on your walls. Plus it feels very egotistical to me, I'm not going to lie. I'm kind of not the biggest fan of trying to have my stuff up all over the place. So there's a guy running a live stream. Um, <laughs> but, um, yeah, I could do Canvas print of some stuff. But, um, I don't know. I've, uh, I think recently, that's, that's the whole drive of the traditional art that I was telling you about earlier. Is, uh... There's something, there's something about having something that I've made that I can automatically just go like, this is something I've put together. Like this is something I made and I finished it today and I can go and hang it up today. That's pretty rad. But yeah, I don't actually have, I think I may have two pieces of my own art up in my own house, which was an old college project I did where I drew, um, it was like a Spider-Man project I was working on, um, senior project in college, so nothing official. God, I'd love to have official Spider-Man art on my walls, that'd be rad. Um, but yeah. It's, it's weird. I have this strange hang-up where I think it's mildly egotistical. You have your own art on your own walls. Like, you know, if you make a physical piece, you know, that's, that's something nice. But I feel like if I go to the trouble of doing something digitally, and then print and frame and do all that stuff, it just feels like a lot. I've got thousands of boxes out in the world with my art on it. You know, I don't need one in my home.
Now, that being said, I do have a crap ton of art up in my house, though. Just weird stuff I've collected over the years. Um, lots of weird stuff I've collected over the years. Oh, man, I'm so close. Okay, I'm going to add a little bit to his under thing here. Just a bit. Maybe pop a little in the eyes, just because it'll look nice. Okay, and let's... Just gonna cheat a little bit and not render out the whole tail because I don't want to. Oh, who came up with the little cluck idea? Jonathan, 100%. I think we talked about it and we talked about what an expansion would look like, and there was that pirate ship, and he loves Monkey Island so much. Like, definitive game of his childhood. And, uh,. So we started talking about it. It's like, so LeChuck, or LeChuck in the game turned into La Cluck. And then the second it was like Ghost Pirate Chicken, we were like, yeah. But then we were like, you know what? We've already fought a dude as the uh, end game boss. Why don't we fight a lady? So then we made uh, LeCluck a woman and titled her La Cluck instead of LeCluck. And uh, yeah. And uh, the drumstick peg leg was my idea, just going through it. And, you know, it's a chicken pirate lord, and Wander's got a sense of humor, so I was like, yeah, screw it, we're going to have fun. I kind of don't like that. There we go. Okay, um... I'm going to call this uh, overlay layer. Oh yeah, Jonathan. Jonathan forced me to play the first. Yeah, it's great. I liked all parts of Monkey Island. It was it was fun. Okay, we're gonna put this on overlay. We're gonna launch this down about forty percent and. Yeah, 60 looks good. This is going to be super subtle overall. But overlay just kind of pops things. Do I put Easter eggs in my art? Uh, yes. Yes, I do. Um, <laughs> in the Cult of Barnacle Bay, um, in the video, the whole thing's broken down into layers. Um, that way Jonathan could zoom through and show you guys like all the cool stuff in there. And um, also, I think I'm done. Woo! Um, so... Jonathan could put in all these different layers and things, so I, I had to draw the ground, I had to draw the center of town, I had to draw the front of all the buildings and stuff, so there's like a full Barnacle Bay shot that's just the environment. Um, well, in that environment shot, uh, which I don't know if he used it in the book or not, there's actually a, um, a narwhal, which um, there's, a, there's a fountain that has a narwhal at the top of it. 
and it's like you know shooting water out of its horn and the funny thing is is the narwhal was the unofficial mascot of john and liz's family crest so when they got married i drew them a family crest and jonathan had his mohawk up i won't go into full details of the story but he like spiked it up into like a unicorn horn and he was like yeah it's like a unicorn horn but he went like yeah but i'm fat so it's more like a narwhal so <laughs> we started um putting narwhals into things and so uh there's a narwhal in barnacle bay there's one of the cards the healing fountain that's actually the narwhal barnacle bay thing um as far as other easter eggs occasionally i'll do something um but it's rare it's not like aaron lovejoy who hides uh certain piece of human anatomy in all of his dioramas which you should look into it's really freaking funny um but no it's a good time but no i don't do anything directly so much anymore oh yeah i gotta sign this uh well it's a good color let's use that that sounds good all right Thor and Scythe? Wait, was there a Thor and Scythe? Probably in the background somewhere. I can see it. All right. That's pretty cool. Got rolling down, got some rim lighting on them, got some shadows, got some highlights, got all sorts of stuff. Nice. I wonder though, I got a couple minutes, let's see if I can't uh, do something here. I was just talking about the uh, Barnacle Bay background. <laughs> That's funny. what we were talking about with the uh, environment piece, Tristan, is, um, I don't know if you can see it here. Narwhal. Oh yeah, there's also fish vomiting uh, water, which I thought was cute. Also, uh, I didn't design the stained glass piece in any kind of given decent time, but I did have a lot of fun digitally painting all this weird mud and stuff in here. That was a good time. So I'm going to take this and I'm going to pull a maneuver. Eh, I think it's fine. Anyways, I'm going to save this. I'm going to export out uh, the file. Whoop. You guys don't need to see my breakdown of files. Cancel. Eh, whatever. It's fine. Nice. Do they turn back over time? Yes. Wander isn't that dark that they're just permanently jacked up. Um, as soon as they're free of Elder Bane and Pandulu's corruption, um, they start transforming back slowly over time. Oh cool, my finger stopped bleeding. That's good. I had a mild incident doing a little house labor and sliced my pinky. It's fine. 
just a little blood. Um, okay, interesting. Thank you for the lesson, Photoshop. Um, but yeah. Anyways, uh, it is 3.57. I've wrapped up Roland uh, in an appropriate amount of time, which I'm very proud of. I'm very happy with how he turned out. Uh, Tristan, like I said, I will be working on your stuff next. Actually, that was a question I wanted to ask you, if you're still tuned in. Um, would you be okay if I worked on your design for the live stream? I think it'd be something interesting. Yes, they free them. No enemies are killed. They are all defeated. If I'm right, I, if I remember right, I think Elder Bane... Oh, awesome, man. Thank you. Well, I will get to that uh, the next time I stream, which should be Wednesday or Thursday. I'm thinking about cutting this to two times a week, but we'll see. Um... Yeah, I, I believe Elder Bane ends up taking himself out by, like, the, the building collapsing in on him. I can't remember, though, to tell you the truth. All I know is he didn't violently die in some way, shape, or form. He is uh, he's taking a nap. They're all sleeping and taking a nap. They all went to a farm upstate. <laughs> all right. Well, anyways, that is it. Um, I'm sure we'll talk more, uh, Tristan, about the... Uh, uh, commission uh, off the stream but um, shorthand thanks for sticking in and talking to me for a while this has been delightful um, but until the next time uh, take it easy guys uh, make sure to like and subscribe my channel and I'm on twitch as heathasaurus art h-e-a-t-h-a-s-a-u-r-u-s -A -A -U -U art I'm also on instagram and on facebook as art of hf um, I'm going to be posting all of my acrylic painting pieces which i'm stupid proud of on there so make sure to go and check it out and uh, until next time take it easy guys and yeah like tristan said be safe stay indoors be smart wash your hands uh don't cough on people don't collect ice cream uh don't stick your finger in sockets uh be careful with knives band-aids are good all that kind of stuff all right take it easy guys